Hey guys, this is Cole with Regal. Regal. Take two. Hey, hey guys, this is Cole with Regal Metalworks. Hey, I'm here in on a Sunday just to try and uh, go over what I accomplished this past week. I didn't video much of it uh, because I was mostly working on it and I didn't really have time. But uh, what we got here is this rack, this roof rack, safari rack, whatever you may call it, finished. I finished it up yesterday at 7 p.m. And uh, I only got a few pictures of it, but I didn't document any of it. I meant to do some documentation yesterday, but I, I knew I was gonna be pushing the limits. And I didn't really want this, this project to bleed over into next week because I have quite a few more projects that I gotta get started and I'm a little bit behind on. Um, one of these being these gas tanks I got to figure out. I got a transmission in that uh, customer spent thousands on getting redone, rebuilt, all dressed up only to install it and it got caught on something and he broke it. So I got to fix this guy, that up. Not a big deal, but normally stuff like that I love to get done like ASAP because it's pretty straightforward. There's no real thought process that needs to be done in it. And uh, so this guy was pretty big and it's still, you know, it takes up a lot of real estate here. Uh, my well table is a five by five and a half foot table, square inch and a quarter plate top. And you can see it comes off at still another five plus feet, five and a half feet. I think this thing's like 10 and a half or 11 feet overall. But it's all uh, 60, 61 T6, inch and a quarter, 125 wall. Uh, it was all done in Fusion 360, designed it all in Fusion 360. And I printed everything out here. I think I showed this in previous vlogs. Um, this really just helps the workflow go. So now I know when I'm working on this piece, my measurements for my cuts, everything, where everything needs to be, so I'm not having to resort to the computer. It's easier just to print it out. My radiuses, where my cuts are, and uh, the overall design right here. And uh, it turns out and it looks exactly the same thing with the exact same measurements uh, within probably an eighth of an inch, you know, width wise. You know, when, anytime you're welding something, I mean, stuff's going to shimmy and move. Anytime you're coping, you know, it's hard to line your copes up so that they're perfect. Um, I was able to use, I have a gauge that allows the, at least to be in, in, in line so they're not off from one end to the other end, which would cause a problem. But cutting them to just the length and coping them just perfectly um, is a little bit difficult uh, because you don't have like an exact measurement to, to know exactly where you're going to be at, where you're going to drill at. So, but uh, I hand fitted all those pieces. Um, the fronts I hand fitted here too as well. They all fit pretty nice. And then on the back in the CAD model, originally I designed, I was just going to use this three inch uh, 125 uh, thick plate. But I wanted something a little bit more substantial in the back, you know, because it is the back, so we got the back and the front. Uh, not that I was concerned too much with this bending or too much, but I, in any event, it's gonna be solid in the front and back, and the sides are just basically to keep this upper rail from, you know, flexing. So that's basically what we got there. And I also wanted to go over how exactly I welded this. Uh, I, I want to document some of that and I apologize I didn't document any of that I wasn't feeling too great yesterday and it was a long day and I was just trying to get it done and I uh, really didn't feel like being in front of the camera trying to set a camera up uh, and filming some of this but uh, I'll go over it how I welded it with the uh, Miller AeroWave and uh, some of the settings I used and how I did it now this is pretty much you're pushing the limits of a 200 amp machine now that's a that's a 380 or 360 amp machine um, not a problem but I, I left it set at 200 amps and uh, I was able to weld this out no problem now anytime you're welding aluminum as any of you guys might have uh, experienced or maybe you're not sure why it's happening or maybe you know you just you would like to weld aluminum but you're don't know what to expect it's different than welding steel generally when you when you light up on a piece of steel and you get that puddle flowing that puddle will stay right there your piece stays a pretty consistent heat with what you got and aluminum is a completely different beast when you light up on it it's going to be cold it's going to take a lot longer for that puddle to form and then when that puddle does finally form when you start your weld till you get to your end of the weld whether it's three inches or you're doing welding around a coping 
it's going to get hotter. And as that piece gets hotter, the aluminum is going to flow out. It's going to melt a lot different. And generally, the hotter it is, the warmer the piece of metal in aluminum, it will flow a lot nicer than when you initially weld. So if you're wondering how I got some of these welds so consistent here, the trick to this is, I don't know if we can focus on that a little bit better. There we go. The trick is you got to weld it twice. So you, let, you lay your bead down the first time, all right? Starting here, welding right to left, it's cold. So the weld's gonna be much narrower, it's gonna beat up a little bit higher, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna go out wide like this. So by the time you get down here, you can see the heat starts pushing it down in. So by the time I get down here, I'm done adding my filler rod, I got a nice bead here, but it's not consistent. It's, it's, it's narrower up here and wider out here. So what I do is I go back over and then you can either manually foot pulse, in other words, pumping your foot pedal, or you can set your machine up to pulse it. And uh, I do both. With this, I just use the pulse. And I set my pulse up for like one pulse per second. And I set the foreground uh, on time to about 35% and right about 15% for the back time. Because I don't need to keep it hot. It's already hot. And uh, I'll just go lay right across that. And then I'll flush that out and you'll get a nice even weld because it's already warm down here. It's actually pretty hot. It's already hot there. So you're just going over and you're dressing up your weld. So you can see it's very consistent with all the welds. And the same thing goes for when I'm doing welding the coping. So on the coping, let's see if I can get over here. We can see one a little bit better right here in the front here. You can see that. So how I welded that was very similar. Is I would, would go ahead, actually one side I would weld with pulse. And when I welded with pulse, I was able to get it hot enough that I'd go back over it. I'd weld from here to here in one pass. And then I'd have to, I actually flip this whole thing over. So I'd weld one side, the whole way's down, we'd flip it over, and then I'd weld the other side. And that gave us a very consistent finish. It gave us, we we're pushing the filler material into it so we got a good uh, bond there. When I had to weld these guys, this was straight up and down. This is a lot more difficult to weld, to, to weld easier. What I did is I turned the pulse off I welded it with just straight 200 amps, just pumping it in, feeding it in. Thinner here, wider here, and then go back over it while it's hot, and just use your pulse, or manually use your foot pulse and pulse it in. It's pretty much what I did for all these. Because when I had to weld in here, this inside here, I didn't have a lot of room. I actually had to position my body in here. I actually propped this up so I was welding in the air instead of down low. I was able to, to weld those in. And those turned out really nice on the inside. But with aluminum, don't be afraid to go back over it and weld it. When I do cast weldings a lot, like I'll show you over here, on this guy, when I weld this, and the same thing with when I do weld repairs, I weld it multiple times. So when this piece gets put in here, I think this goes something like this. This will get put in here. So what I'll do is I'll grind this, I'll bevel these edges down on the outside and probably the inside, depending on how well I can get in there. I'll lay a bead down across that, nice and good, as best as I can. And this will take a while for this to get warm. So when I start welding it, it's not gonna be the prettiest up here. You know, it's not gonna lay in real nice and give you that real nice consistent look. But with cast, what I like to do then is go back over it and manually foot pulse it. I foot pulse that in, and what happens is that it allows me to control the puddle better. So I can see when it's starting to flow out, because certain areas are going to be hotter and cooler than others, depending if the cast is thick in one area and thinner in the other. This seems to be pretty consistent. It's thicker here than it is here. That's thinner, I can feel that. And then of course up here, it's really thick. So I might have to still manually pulse to get more heat into the thicker areas and uh, control my heat better when I get into the thinner areas so you don't blow through. The other thing is with cast is you never know how well the casting is. I mean, there's going to be air pockets in there. Oh, it looks like they might have tried to JB weld this. <laughs> yeah, I think they did there. That's funny. Somebody did. Anyways, so you'll have to uh, just feather it in with your foot, applying the heat after you put your filler in, you know, one good pass. And then if, if stuff starts coming out, you'll get some... Uh, inclusions in your weld because there's going to be impurities that come out of that you're just going to have to go over that wire brush it out 
re-weld it. That's what I'll do. I've fixed engine casings like that um, that were blown through with broken rods. Not a problem. So this, this should be a piece of cake depending on you know, the quality of the casting. Um, you know, I, I'm not crazy that it's all painted and everything, so I'll have to remove, remove all the, the painting first. And of course, when we get this good and hot, it's gonna, it's gonna start to stinking, smell like uh, burning plastic and paint. I always hate that, but we have a ventilation fan up there. Anyway, so I want to go over that with you guys um, today before the customer comes. It'll probably show up tomorrow or something like that and I have to fit it and I probably won't document it and I'll forget and then he'll leave and I'll be like, ah oh, man, I totally wanted to document it because I showed you in my last video how we actually bent this 6611 uh, or 6061 T6511, how we actually bent that without snapping it. Um, so go back and look at that if you're curious. Um, that's a pretty good uh, instructional on how to really do it if you need to bend some of this. Like a, if all you have is some 60-60-11 T6, which is very common, bar, plate, whatever, and you need to bend it and you're going to heat it and bend it, you, you'll, or not heat it, you're going to have to heat it before you bend it. Um, if you're going to bend it in a press brake or a tube bender or something like that, you'll have really good results if you anneal it first by heating it. So that's about all I have for this week. Uh, I'll try and get some more documentation coming up. I have some new projects I'm working on. I have a new design that I came up with that I really chomping at the bit to get out. Um, but I got to find the time to do it. So I'm kind of in here on Sunday to try and uh, maybe, uh, you know, do some uh, beta tests of some of this new project. So other than that, guys, have a good one. We'll talk to you later. Peace. So bring your A game. Cause you know this party won't stop. We could never run out of time. Sipping strawberry lime. You know I wanna share it with you. Bass is going boom.